Chairman, we're live. OK, thank you very much indeed. Good morning, everybody, and uh, uh, welcome to those who are watching and also the board members to the Hertfordshire Fire Pension Board on Tuesday, the 23rd, uh, 22nd of March, 22. Um, I just have an announcement to make as we are um, being broadcast and the council will be holding this meeting electronically. Members of the public may also attend this meeting in an electronic capacity and there is a link on the council website for them to do so. Members of the board are asked to keep their microphones switched off until called on to speak and to switch their microphones off once they had finished. Cameras may be left on throughout the meeting if members so wish. However, if you experience connection or other technical issues, it may help to switch off your camera. Cameras should be switched on if and when speaking at the meeting. To indicate a wish to speak, members should use the raise hand function use, uh, use of the meeting chat function uh, is only for voting. At the end of the debate, <clears throat> on each item of business, there will be a vote. Members should vote using the me meeting chat function by indicating for, against or abstain. Uh, I will de declare the result after each vote. Uh, I don't anticipate the meeting to be uh, very lengthy. However, breaks will be uh, taken every two hours of 15 minutes um, and will be taken after a speaker in the debate has finished. If the board are voting, the vote will be concluded before the break is taken. Uh, other breaks will be incorporated uh, as appropriate. All right. Well, as I say, good morning to to uh, everybody. Um, there are no substitutes as far as I'm aware, and uh, and I don't have any apologies. I think we are all here today. Uh, there is a, uh, there will be a change in membership. I know that Jill your good child and good morning to you Jill is leaving the organization and stepping down from the board <coughs> having served a four-year term and I think on behalf of all my colleagues and all the fire service uh, we wish you well in the future and Jill we thank you for your participation over a very long time so well done Jill and I'm sure my colleagues will agree on that. Uh, my name is uh, County Councillor Mark Mills Bishop. I'm the chairman of the board. And may I then ask members if they could introduce themselves? And if I uh, if I go around uh, very briefly from my sheet, uh, Daniel Daniel Cooper. Yeah. Good morning, all. Uh, Watch Commander Daniel Cooper, um, serving obviously Watch Commander within the service, and I'm a member representative. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, Jill, for the last time. Yep. Good morning, everybody. My name's Jill Goodchild. I'm Head of Specialist Services for Community Protection and here as an employer representative. OK, and uh, our Vice Chairman, uh, Darren. Good morning, everyone. Yes, Darren Scotchford, uh, Station Commander, Operational Training and uh, Member Representative. And finally, I also have uh, Simon Good morning, everyone. Simon Tuhill. I'm an Assistant Chief Fire Officer for Service Improvement and I am uh, an employer representative. All right, thank you very much indeed. Um, we turn to the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, uh, the agenda in a moment. I just want to remind members if you have any interest on any particular subject to uh, uh, declare any pecuniary or a declarable uh, interest. And you can either do that at the beginning of the uh, 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 each report uh, or if you suddenly realise halfway through, whoops, I, I have an interest here, then uh, quite happy for you to declare that. All right, well, we go to the uh, the minutes then, and, uh, uh, which is item one. Um, and these are the minutes that were done on the 21st of December uh, 2021. And uh, before I take matters arising, I'll go through page by page and if you can indicate uh, if you wish to uh, 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 ask a question. So on page uh, one, page two, page three, page four, page five, page six, uh, on page seven, 
and page eight. There is one matter arising which I think is under 4.8 and uh, and I think that will come up in the meeting. Uh, is that co correct? There is a, the final report on the agenda um, covers that, Chairman. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Theresa. All right, then. Um, if I can have an indication from uh, those who are able to vote uh, in the chat box uh, in the chat box for against or abstain. I think that's carried. Yep, unanimously. All right, then. Thank you very much indeed. Let's move on to uh, item two, uh, which is the Fire Pension Risk Register and uh, its quarter three report for 21 22. Now, who's going to report on this? Is it Rob? Yes, it's me, Chairman. Right, Rob, well, over to you. Thank you. Um, so, my name's Robert Winterton. I'm the finance manager for the pensions uh, finance team at Hertfordshire County Council and I just wanted to go through uh, a summary version of the Hertfordshire Fire Pension Risk Register report for quarter three 21-22 which is October to December 2021. Um, there have been two movements in risk uh, categorisation. Pension transfer fraud risk has moved from amber to yellow uh, the likelihood has been amended from unlikely to remote. This is because the fire scheme transfers are rare, um, but additionally, LPPA have updated their processes in line with new legislation, which came into force on the 30th of November 2021. This legislation allows funds to refuse transfers out if certain cri criteria is not met. The other movement is in the project pace risk. Um, this has moved from a yellow risk to an amber risk. Um, the uh, reason for this is the impact has actually increased from moderate to major as officers felt um, that if there was any issues, there would be a, a high impact on, on the pension fund and the data. But the likelihood has reduced from possible to unlikely this is mainly due to the excellent manager of the uh, management of the project by the LPPA and regular assurances given to officers throughout the period. Uh, John Crowhurst from LPPA uh, will update more on project pace um, in this meeting. There's also been one movement in score or risk score, but no change to category categorization. The age discrimination risk has remained amber but the likelihood score has increased from probable to highly probable due to the Home Office withdrawing their support of the immediate detriment memorandum of understanding. I believe Rachel Wilson will provide more detail of this in her report later on in the agenda. That's all I was really going to go through on that report. Um, I welcome any questions. Uh, <coughs> all right, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Robert. Um, I, I, I've got no questions on that. Uh, have colleagues got a question at all? Do I see a hand coming up? Uh, Patrick, is that you coming in? No, no, no chairman. No, sir. It, it was flashing on my screen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what I, what I could say uh, about the risk register, just to set it in context for the uh, members of the board who and this is only the third iteration of this report, is that a broader risk register goes to the pensions committee that covers um, a significant number of other risks that impact the LGPS more than the fire scheme. The fire scheme is what we call a funded scheme, um, whereas the LGPS, we actually manage investments and so they're exposed to a bit more risks. However, um, there are common risks that both the LGPS and fire schemes are exposed to which are captured in this risk register 
and some there may be new risks that evolve in the future will, which means that we might need to refresh the risk register and some risks may be closed off so um, we'll continue to bring this um, quarterly update to you and we welcome your feedback because um, if there is a uh, any sort of misunderstanding of how we score mark risks, um, you know, feel free to ask uh, officers questions because sometimes you look at these tables and they think they, they look a bit confusing, but uh, we're here to support you as board members and explain why we've categorised risks in that manner. I see a question from uh, Jill. Yeah, Jill, thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks, Jill. thanks, Mark. Uh, just on that, Patrick, I suppose my, my question is with what we've got going on in the world at the moment is is the risk gone up a little bit on cyber attack so we we have um done some work with our actuary who helps supports us on the lgps side around cyber risk and uh we're going to have what we call it a a cyber war room risk war room which will look at some penetration attacks most of our systems and john can talk about john crowhurst can talk about it um when he does his lppa uh, presentation most of our risks with regards to the fire scheme would be around the systems that the lppa use um and uh, they do a lot of um cyber risk testing they've got a lot of firewalls and um he can he can talk a bit more about that but with respect to the other side the pension scheme we've got a lot of other providers that we are talking to as well about how frequently they test their systems as well yeah no that's very important thank you uh, thank you patrick um anyone else got a question you didn't have your hand up patrick uh, it was just that your 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 profile was 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 um flashing at me <laughs> so i apologize for that it wasn't uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay all right well if there is no other questions then um the recommendation <clears throat> is shown on the report uh and the fire pension board is asked to note um and we have commented on the contents of the report so if you could vote in chat please I think we've all voted. Is that right, Teresa? Yeah. Yeah, that is agreed. All right. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we go on to agenda item three, um, <clears throat> which is a report on the LGA firefighters pension scheme, uh, Matthews and Sargent survey. And I think, Rachel, are you talking to this one? Yes, I am. OK, over to you then, Rachel. OK. Hello. Um, so yes, this is a short report on the actions which have been taken on the recommendations made by the LGA with regards to the Matthew Sargent survey, which was completed by HCC. Um, so um, back in the summer, um, the LGA um, and the Scheme Advisory Board um, released a survey to all fire authorities, kind of trying to assess how prepared they were in terms of the um, McLeod, but also the um, Matthews um, remedies, which, which are coming. Um, so we completed the survey and we sort of had input from um, HR, the business partners, um, community protection, um, the Fire and Rescue Service and LPPA, and also finance. And in December, the Scheme Advisory Board published a report um, once they'd had all the responses back from the FRAs. And then they wrote to the board in December with a couple of recommendations on um, HCC's response. So those there was two recommendations. The first one was that we establish a remedy project team or have a named lead contact. Um, so in response, um, LPPA do actually already have a project team in place um, for the McLeod remedy. So we didn't think it was necessary to duplicate what they were doing. Um, however, I will be the named contact for um, HCC and I will link with um, the LPPA and the Fire and Rescue Service um, to provide updates and do the um, employer responsibilities, um, the payroll 
data collection and the communication with members working with the Fire and Rescue Service. The second um, recommendation was about improving the level of internal pensions knowledge and capacity. Um, the survey did ask us to self um, score ourselves on a scale of one to 10 and um, we did put five. However, in hindsight, I think that should have actually been an eight because when we were scoring ourselves, I, I, we didn't take into account the excellent knowledge that LPP have as our administrators and LPP have recently increased their capacity and resource in that area and their knowledge is of a far more technical nature than what we have in HCC. So um, it, that should have been scored at an eight. However, we do have um, some upskilling that we should do within HR and the fire service with a change of personnel within the business partner team and within the fire service. So we will be looking to do some upskilling over the next few months. Um, and that's, that's the end of the report. That would be your report. All right, thank you very much indeed. Uh, in terms of the initial rating of five, was that just a cautious approach or or do you then have, uh, I think which you've explained, a bit of an in-depth think about it? Is that right? Yeah, I, I think I was being over cautious and I didn't really fully appreciate that obviously we contract LPPA to provide that service on our behalf. So I think I was just being a bit closed off when we thought about rating ourselves, just looking at HCC rather than looking wider at our partners that we buy in that service from. Right, because it's from our partners, I think, we get the technical and in-depth uh, uh, coverage. Is that right? That's correct, yes. All right, then. OK. All right. Well, thank you very much indeed, then, Rachel, for that. Uh, any questions from anyone? Right. No one is flashing uh, and there are no hands up. Um, Simon Thuhill has a question. Ah, right. Yes, I've, I've got it now. Simon, good morning to you. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. So, um, the report asks us to note the actions taken against the recommendations. So my question is just, are we now discharging those actions and saying they're completed? Because it feels like they are, because both of them are. So is that now the action plan we have against those recommendations is now completed? Is that right, Rachel? Um, well, the I suppose we do need to complete the upskilling um, internally um, within fire service and within HR, um, but otherwise they're, they're complete. OK, so is it yeah. going to come back as another paper when we've completed that? Or do we not need to do that? Because I, 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 because we're asking to be to note it, but actually what mm. we're saying is the action plan is completed or is it not complete? I think that's probably what I'm pushing for. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it, it feels unnecessary to bring a, a report just to say that we've completed the training. Um, if, if you can, you I know. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. yeah. So in that case, um, we, we're noting it and also agreeing that the that we discharged the, the actions against it. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, does anybody else have a comment on that? No. All right then. OK, well, if uh, I mean, the recommendation uh, is that, as um, Simon has pointed out, is that we uh, 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 note the contents of the report and that it can be discharged. Uh, but we note also the fact that uh, uh, there is the upskilling that still needs to be done. And we also should make a note of the fact that the um, the rating has gone up from five to eight. So there's no no confusion about that. If everybody is happy on that, uh, then I would ask you to vote either for, against or abstain. And that has been agreed. <coughs> All right, now we move on to uh, item uh, five, uh, four, Local Pensions Partnership Administration, um, the Firefighters Pension uh, Administration Report, quarter three for the year 21-22. And I think um, uh, we got John, is that right? John, are you going to take us through this report? Yes, thank you, Chairman, I will do. All right, good morning to you, John, thank you. Thank you. Um, 
morning everyone um so yeah this is the the performance report for for quarter three covering the period between october and december 2021 um in terms of the the areas that i just wanted to bring your attention to in the report performance uh, for the period was was good uh, 100% um, against the 95% uh, target um, so all of the individual process were were actioned on on time um, you'll probably also note that the the number of ongoing processes in our system between October and December fell um, from 70 to 51. Um, that that was a conscious effort and continued into to the the current quarter because um, what we're trying to do is is bring to a conclusion as many of those processes as, as we can before we migrate over to the to the new system. Um, so we, you know, so far we've been successful in reducing the, the number of ongoing cases, which is which is good. Um, on the elapsed times of each individual process, you'll see there is an outlier um, in the report, which is the the transfer out elapsed time increased from roughly between well around 39 days on average up to 90 days in the last period. Um, just to let you know, that was one particular case. Um, so it's relatively small numbers that we process. I'm on behalf of the Hertfordshire Fire Scheme, um, but we processed, I think it was five um, transfers out, uh, if, of which one of those took 312 days, which was as a result of some delays um, with the receiving scheme uh, coming back to us on a number of, of items. So if you, if you took that outlier out of the report, the average number of days would actually be 34, which is in line with what we'd experienced previously. Um, so I think in you know, probably in the report for Q4 as well, there might be a couple of other outliers because we've probably cleared down some of those historic cases. So what I'll do for the next report is add a page um, which um, pulls out all of the exceptions in the report so you don't have to wait for me you know, for me to, to give you the, the update. Um, so it'll be in the report. Um, the retirement uh, payments within 30 days, again, was, was good for the period. Um, Help desk wait times were below the aspirational target of uh, four minute wait times. Uh, and your common and conditional data scores were, were again, good. Uh, so your common data score was 98.1% and your conditional data score was 97.7%. Um, so that's all I was going to um, say on the performance report, Chairman. Happy to take any questions. Yeah, no, thank you, John. Thank you very much indeed. I mean, it made quite good reading, I have to say, when I when I read it. So well done to all those that have been uh, performing on that. And you were quite right to highlight um, uh, you know, some of the good good points there. In terms of, uh, <clears throat> you know, if I was looking at this blind, as it were, um, you know, where where would I cast my eye uh, to be a little bit cautious about and a little bit careful? Uh, one to watch, if you like, if I was kind of reading the report and, uh, uh, you know, I may have missed something that uh, which, which should be important. Any thoughts on that? So I suppose probably a number of sections um, in truth, Chairman. Um, so what, what we tried to do historically, so we're talking pre 18 months ago, um, we typically only ever report on the sort of quantitative nature of the service. So whether or not we'd hit an SLA target, um, which was fine, I suppose. But what we've tried to do is is make the report a little bit broader and focus a bit more on the qualitative measures. So things like the satisfaction scores coming back from members that are actually interacting with us. Um, so we've got the satisfaction scores in the uh, in the report now, I think, for calls and for people that have retired. Um, I think even though this is an, an is not an SLA target, one of the things that we, we we will continue to focus on is making sure that people receive their first pension payment within 30 days of retiring, because we think that's important. There shouldn't be any break in, in payment. Um, so at the moment that's performing performing well. And um, so I'd keep an eye on, on that. Um, and the other things that can move, I suppose, significantly between the periods, depending on what's going on, um, is probably the, the call wait times as well. Um, and when I give an update on project pace, I'll be able to give the, the board an update on what current performance looks like, because obviously I'm conscious we're nearly at the end of Q4 now. So. OK, no, no, I, I, I uh, um, appreciate that, uh, you know, because I think it's very important, you know, that that that. Uh, you know, the service that is provided to members is, you know, as top as it could be. And I, I think that is very important. 
Is there any other questions from from anybody? I cannot see any. No, no, and no one is flashing. Uh, I like that. I must find out why that that flashed, but no hand went up. Uh, all right, no, that's good. Uh, thank you very much indeed, John. And I look forward to uh, the quarter four one then. Thank you. Uh, if we can vote then, <coughs> uh, recommendation uh, for uh, noting the report uh, uh, against or abstain. I think um, I have to keep looking at my computers. I've got a bank, uh, a bank of computers here that uh, <laughs> that I'm looking at. And uh, right, I think we're all OK. Yep. OK, that is agreed then. All right, we go to the final, I think the final one on the agenda. Is that right? Let me have a look. It is uh, uh, the report uh, item five on the Sorry, agenda. Chairman. The report on yeah, Chairman, sorry to interrupt you, Chairman. I think, John, um, you did want to cover Project Pace, didn't you? Uh, there was a there was a, um, a presentation that John wanted to talk to, which was uh, one of the appendices to his report. Right. Yeah, it's no, quite it's right. quite it's quite an important piece as well because of uh, yeah, the administration no, no. of the service. Right. No, uh, we can go straight to that then now. Um, uh, John, apologies for that. Thank you, Pat, uh, Patrick, for for jumping in. And apologies uh, for you want to go, go. <laughs> I, I was like, I thought it was um, I thought it was a separate agenda item, Chairman. That's why I was waiting for you to get to it, but it's not. So I can cover it now. Apologies. Um, no, <laughs> no, okay, no, no, uh, no, no problem. Go ahead, John. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. So, so yeah, this is an update on Project Pace, which I think we discussed briefly at the last board, which is um, a huge a huge transformation project for us where we're changing our pensions administration system. So firstly, I will, um, I just need to flag a, 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 um, an update to the report that I've put in the pack. So the, the go live date for the Fire and Rescue Service is not the 24th of March. It's not this Thursday. It is actually the 30th of March. Right. So apologies for that. It's actually next Wednesday that we'll be going live with that, the fire service. Is that is that a reason for that or um, any reason? Well, it, um, so originally we were going to align the, the county council, so the local government scheme um, with the fire scheme go live. Um, but we don't need to do that. We have got some contingency in our plan um, and we haven't we haven't gone live with any fire scheme yet on the new system. Um, so we wanted some additional time to, to test the portals in particular um, before we go live next week. So we've just we just decided to utilise some of that contingency. So I'll give you a bit of context on where we've got to, um, and then obviously happy to take any any questions. So, so we did originally go live on the twenty sixth of January um, with, and again this is just local government schemes. Um, so it's free clients that we went live with on that date, which was about fifty eight thousand members. Um, and then on the twenty fourth of February, we added our fourth client, which was another ninety two thousand members. So we've got one hundred and fifty thousand members uh, on the on the new operating platform. Um, and obviously it's you know it's working. Um, Hertfordshire County Council is one hundred and twenty thousand members and we subject to the go no go decision making meeting that is happening as we speak. Uh, we will go live on Thursday this week on the twenty fourth. Um, and then next week on the 30th, we've got um, four fire and rescue services going live, which is about 20,000 firefighters going onto the new system. Um, so in preparation for, for all of this, we've obviously had to train our operational staff. Um, so those, those individuals have been trained so that we've got people that are processing the cases, people that work in pensions payroll um, and our help desk advisors uh, trained and, and using the system and ready to use the system for the fire service. Um, the employers that use the portal, and I appreciate it's slightly different for a fire scheme because there's one employer, um, have all been offered um, or have got scheduled training um, planned so that, that you can use the portal uh, and submit the usual sort of forms that you'd be you'd be sending across to us to notify us of events. Um, members will receive a communication um, on how to register for the new member portal, which is called Pension Point. Um, so we have had over 6,000 members successfully 
register and log in and use the portal so far across the clients that have gone live, um, which is which is good. Um, we are making payments from the system, so we are making refund payments, transfers, lump sums, etc. Um, and we have run our first pensions payroll from the new system. So all of the key events, I suppose, um, have happened now um, and have happened successfully, um, which is good. Uh, in terms of the decision making process for the go lives, um, we've, we've got a, a project steering group that will make a recommendation to our change in technology committee and there's a whole host of things that are that, that are on a dashboard that have to have been um, successfully passed to recommend that go live decision. Um, so I'll just give you a brief overview of some of those items. So the, the obvious ones are things like the data being successfully migrated across and reconciled. Uh, along with the pensions payroll, um, that the calculations have been have been tested and are working, uh, that all of the processes uh, have been configured and our administration staff can can process work end to end. Um, the system is stable and what I mean by that is that if we've got 150 people logged in at the same time using it in anger that it doesn't crash and kick people out. So. It's, it's working well. We've got over 100 users logged in and, and using the system each day. That both the portals, so the employer and member portals, um, are working. People can register. Um, people can access some of the documents that we've we've moved across, and they can use some of the modelers. Um, and that our staff are essentially ready um, and trained to go live. What we have managed to do for the for the fire clients is get ahead of the contractual due dates. Um, so rather, so when we do go live on the 30th, we haven't got a load of work that's contractually due on the day. We have managed to get about two weeks ahead of the contractual due dates. Um, obviously, that doesn't mean we're not going to do anything for two weeks. It just gives us a bit of a buffer and capacity um, to deal with any any hyper care issues that that we might have. Um, so we did share, I think I think it's actually in the pack for the board today, and I have shared with officers at Hertfordshire um, an overview of how things have gone so far. So there are some lessons learned, um, like there always are with these, these types of projects. Um, so I'll just briefly cover those. Um, the first was all of the images that we were migrating to the new system was always planned to be a post go live activity um, and on the basis that it would take one or two days to get those images into the system. The reality is when we went live uh, in January it took nearly three weeks to transfer all of the images and index them to the member records. Um, it didn't impact our ability to process work because we still had the legacy systems to to, to view the images um, on but it was an inconvenience I think for our administration staff having to, to work across two, two systems. Um, so what we've done for Hertfordshire and for the Fire and Rescue Services is we've loaded the images into UPM pre-go live and we will index them to the individual member records post-go live because that has to happen post-go live and um, for the ones that have, have gone live since January that that was successful within two or three days so that that seems to have worked. Uh, the second is access to the system so our staff now um, have to log in via a, a cloud to, to access the the system. Uh, there's a two-factor authentication process, which I'm sure you're familiar with in, in the world of places like banking. Um, on day one, there was issues with mem um, our staff being able to log in. So what we've what we've been doing for the the drop since is people are logging in one or two days before to make sure that they can register and access the system. Um, the third is not all of the letter templates had been loaded at the time of the first go live. Um, and we'd loaded the ones that we use more often. There's loads of different scenarios, as you can imagine, with, with pensions. So some of the less frequent letters hadn't been loaded. Um, the plan is for most, if not all, of those to have been loaded and tested before we, we go live uh, next week. And the last thing, and this, this is um, in relation to performance today, I suppose, and just to bring your attention to this, our court wait times did start to increase um, for a, a couple of reasons. Um, one is that we're communicating with members um, and whenever we communicate with members, it increases our our inbound call traffic. Um, and two, some of the calls that for, for members that um, are on the new system are taking a little bit longer than the old system because our help desk staff are still or were still learning um, about how to navigate uh, the system. So the wait times increased from an average of around two to three minutes up to about 15 minutes. Um, so they did increase significantly. We have taken some action since then. Um, so we've recruited um, three, three more people into the help desk. 
Um, we've changed the way that we handle the calls. Um, so we can see when our peak times are. So as you can imagine, a, a Monday morning um, and at lunch times throughout the week are our busiest call times. So we make sure we've got more people handling calls at those those key times throughout the day. Um, and that did have a desired impact. So the average wait time at the moment is around 10 minutes, uh, but it's still higher than where we'd like it to be. Um, we, 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 you know, we would like it to be around that four to five minute mark again. So we're going to have to keep an eye on on that and see where we get to. And I'll continue to give officers a regular update. Um, and what I've said to officers is that post go live, at least for the first week, we will be giving a daily update on performance. Um, so I'll be I'll be giving an indication as to what the wait times are daily um, post go live. Um, so you'll, you know, we'll be we'll be fully briefed on on what it's all looking like. Um, last couple of things to mention from me is that we are going live in a remote environment. So the majority of our staff are still working remotely and working from home. Um, so what we found is that any hyper care issues, so these are issues with processes and things like that. If we have a team of people that are all on a call like this, probably with their cameras and mics off, um, with people from the project team and Civica, our new system provider, if they have got an issue, they can come off mute and raise those issues live. And um, we found that works really well um, with, with resolving issues quickly. Um, so we'll continue to to carry that forward into, uh, into next week. Um, and the last thing to mention is we have we have gone live with what I would describe as the out of the box product. Um, the system does does quite a lot. Um, and from talking to, to Civica and other large funds that use the product, they, they've made recommendations to us not to go live with everything um, too quickly, not to try and be too clever and configure the system too quickly because you'll learn so much about it do it in a phased way. So all of the functionality that we've gone live with on day one um, isn't the full suite of functionality that will probably be live in, say, 12 months time. So what I will be doing is giving officers some visibility around what functionality we have gone live with and what's in the pipeline to go live with and and when. Um, so I'll pause there. Thank you, Chairman. I'm happy to, to take any questions. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, um, an immediate question I had in terms of the type of calls that come in, are they routed through to a particular uh, handler or not? Or is it a general uh, uh, call that might come in? So within our existing help desk setup, so this was even pre um, pre UPM being implemented, we have got help desk advisors that have got um, expertise or have been trained specifically on the fire scheme. Um, so, so you have got we have got people within the help desk that, that have got more knowledge, I suppose, of the fire scheme because um, obviously the majority of the membership is is the local government scheme. So we wanted to make sure that they had a dedicated route of people calling in. Um, the increase in calls that we've experienced, Chairman, if I'm honest, is all in relation to people trying to log into Pension Point. Right. Um, so different, a number of different um, challenges, I suppose. Some of them were system issues that we've had to fix since go live. Um, some of them are user error, um, and some of them are things that they just need help navigating the system. So what we've done is we've we redirect those calls to a, again a specific yeah, hunt, hunt group of handlers um, so that they can deal with pension point queries specifically um, in a queue because what was happening is you had people that were contacting us about pension point and you had other members that were trying to contact us about the retirement and the people that were contacting us about the retirement were waiting a long time so we've separated the queues um, so it is unfortunate that members that are contacting us about pension point will typically wait longer, but we wanted to prioritise the, you know, the bereavement and retirement calls um, in the help desk queue. Right. OK. All right. Uh, all right. Thanks very much indeed uh, for that. Uh, um, right. I've got three, uh, three up on the line. Uh, I'll go in order. I don't know if um, Simon came in first, but uh, I've got Jill first, then Simon and then Darren. Jill. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a question around the go live date. Did we did we publish that we were going live on the 24th to fire members? Because if so, we'd probably need to let them know that we're not going live to the 30th now in pension point. So I can't I, don't, I can't remember the timeline, Jill, of what's been communicated and when, uh, but I know that our 
engagement team are specifically handling all of the updates to the member. So I, I don't think we have um, communicated that yet because we, I think we did what they call a teaser email a few months ago to say that we were changing our member portal. Um, but I'm not sure whether or not it confirmed which date that was happening on. So they've got a schedule of comms going out um, over the next couple of weeks, essentially to the members that informs them um, of when the new portal will be live and how to, to register, which includes a number of um, explainer videos um, to help them navigate uh, the portal. Um, so I'm pretty sure that we've done that comms, but I'll, I'll double check after this call anyway. I think we might have sent around something locally as well, which talked about right. the 24th. Okay. And how does that comms come to members, John? It's by, it is by email, Jill. It okay. is by email. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's a good point. Uh, thank you, Jill, for that. Uh, Simon. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so I, I guess first one's an observation rather than a question. It feels like uh, this board has been timed slightly unfortunately really or perhaps the go live date is unfortunate but you could look at it both ways couldn't you and uh, uh, if we were tomorrow we would know whether we were definitely going live and if we were the back end of next week we would have gone live or not uh, as it happens we're now you know going to be three months away till we know I guess that gives it a chance to settle in but it's more of a, a, an observation than a, than a question uh, uh, my only other second follow-up is just around the the weights for um, the phone call waiting times. Uh, and John, you said the average was 15 minutes. Well, if the average is 15 minutes, that means some people have had to wait significant amount of times to get up to 15 minutes, I'm presuming. Uh, and that, you know, that just in terms of customer satisfaction, keep an eye on that one. Yeah. Yeah, another good point, uh, Simon, uh, uh, in terms of the wait time, I think, yeah, that is very important. Uh, Darren. Yeah, thank you, Chair. So a bit a bit like Simon, really, is an observation that may turn into a question. Um, so looking at the uh, um, my pension online, the the overall figure was around about 48 percent for those that are registered. Um, so that's not exactly where we want it to be. Um, people now transferring across. And I suppose, John, my question maybe to you is, have you seen a drop off from those existing figures? And then what what can we do in terms of work? And that might be a question for the employer side, if you like, around what we communications we can do to encourage people to register on, on, on pensions point. Um, as we're already starting from quite a low base, it suggests to me that it might go lower because people won't be aware and we need to perhaps communicate that. Yeah, so the so essentially what everyone will have to do is re-register. So you will literally go from 40, 50 percent down to zero um, next next Wednesday. Um, what I will say is we we do phase we have to phase the comms to, to deal with the inbound call traffic. Um, but the number of people registering is increasing um, day on day. Um, so it hasn't sort of plateaued. It seems to just increase at a steady rate. Um, and that could be just because our comms continues to go out and it might tail off. I think what just speaking from my experience over over the years of trying to get people to register for for my pension online, um, typically you see a spike when there's a reason for someone to log in. So, for example, when we send the when we send the P60s out to pensioners or when we send the annual benefit statements, like you always see a spike. So I suspect it's going to be a slow uptake initially, um, Darren. And then once we do those bulk processes, there'll be a spike. Um, in the number of people registered um, and I think the average across all of our clients and to be fair five the five five scheme is, is typically higher than the LG in terms of the number of people registered um, for LG it hovers around the 33 34 percent on average and for fire it's between 40 and 45 percent um, and that seems to have been where it's where it's been despite campaigns both from LPPA and from the the employer as well so I think we just have to keep an eye on that no thank you john that's really helpful actually that context around that comparator that's actually because although 48 percent to me seems low what you're saying there's actually that's that's actually quite good so that, yeah, that's really helpful. thank you yeah. well thank you for that john uh, daniel yeah thank you chair yeah thanks john um just regarding the uh the call wait time what the, the last two have echoed really um uh, 
it is the it's a it's the wait time because of the duration of the calls are quite significant. Obviously, for individual cases, there's there are people on the phone for quite a long time. And secondly, on that, do we do we thought about a service where people are uh, advised on the um, uh, on, on the waiting kind of time during during the call? So you you're next you you'll be fifteen minutes in this in this handle, or even we explore anything about like a, like a callback kind of service. Yeah, no, thanks, Dan. Yeah, that's a, they're all good questions. I'm not sure um, whether our we, whether we've got the functionality to tell people how long they're going to wait. I think at the moment it just tells them what position they are in the queue, which you know you can't you can't really gauge, can you? How long you're going to you're going to actually wait as a result of, of that? Um, I, the, I think the reason I don't think we're actually getting that many more um, calls if you take away the pension point calls. Um, what I think what's happening is because people are waiting longer, they're doing exactly what you said. They're abandoning the call and they're they're calling again. So it looks like we're getting more calls, but it's a repeat caller um, trying to get through to us. And we did experience some um, um, delays in responding to to email inquiries as well. So, you know, just personally, again, if, if I was to, to try and call um, a help desk and not be able to get through, um, I'll probably will then email and then if I don't get a response to the email I'll call again so I know that the operational teams have made a conscious effort to get back on top of the wait times for emails and web forms which I think will will bring down some of the the repeat callers um, coming back in in terms of offering a, a callback service um, we don't do that in the traditional sense um although if somebody did, did contact us by web form and said can can i arrange a call with you know someone from our administration team we would we would facilitate that um but they would have to go through the web form process currently um i think we just need to keep a, a close eye on it because i mean everyone's got slightly different views on what's a reasonable wait time um, but as as Dan's highlighted, to bring that average up to 15 minutes, you have got people that have been waiting for 50, 50 minutes, an hour. Um, so, you know, we don't want people waiting that long in, in any circumstance. Um, so what we'll continue to do is is look at the way that we operate the help desk um, and try and make, you know, pull the levers that we've got to pull to try and bring that wait time down. Um, and as I say, I'll be giving updates to to officers on where we get to. Is that with John that. Can you can you hear me still? Yeah. Um, yeah. But we, you know we can't we can't have the the help desk wait times up at that that sort of level for for a prolonged period of of time because it's not it's not a good member experience um, at all. So we'll do everything that we can to to, to manage that. Um, we we'll just have to keep keep an eye on where we where we get to um, over the next few weeks. Um, what I have suggested as well to officers and we do because uh, as you can imagine there's pension committees and pension boards um, and typically when members escalate things they go to officers or or members of the pension board and the, and the ca and ca councillors. Um, so I'm happy to provide a, a, an update to all of the boards and committees in a standard format that just gives you an overview of where we've got to with the project so at least you've got something um, as member of, of the board in case you are um, in case anything is escalated to you as, as individuals so I can give you a pretty standard PowerPoint presentation on 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 um, where we've got to and I've done something similar for for Patrick um, and the actual the pensions committee of the county council so again you know you can use that um, as an update from us. No, that's great, John. Yeah, that's also my question. Thank you. Um, it just whether the, uh, you know, the the on hold message is uh, during busy times, you might be might have a quick response via email and just maybe streamlining that service. But I'm sure that's yeah. something you're you're doing anyway. Yeah, thanks very much. That's great. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Daniel, and thank you, John, uh, for that. Um, yeah, I think the uh, the two uh, messages to take away, I think, is clearly around communication and also about wait time and. Um, uh, you know, Simon made a very good point there that uh, uh, the frustration of waiting on the end of a phone must be uh, horrendous. And I think we've probably all uh, experienced it in some service or another uh, for those wait times. But uh, thank you, John. I don't see any more hands going up. Now, Teresa, do we need to re-vote on this one? Not unless anybody has changed their vote providing you're still in agreement with the uh, recommendations and we can leave it as was. As, as was. All right. No, I appreciate that, John, and I appreciate also the, uh, you know, the coming back to alert members as well, which is, I think, is very important. 
All right, OK, we can move on then to um, uh, item five. And um, yep, item five, and we got a report on age discrimination and uh, immediate detriment. And I think, uh, Rachel, is that you again coming back? Yes, it's me again. OK, Rachel, thank you. OK, um, so this report is to update the board on the council's treatment of immediate detriment cases. Um, at the last board meeting, um, I brought quite a detailed report about the background of immediate detriment and um, the position um, and decisions taken by the council. And um, at the last meeting, we were in the position where the Home Office had withdrawn its immediate detriment guidance. Therefore, HTC had decided um, to stop processing um, immediate detriment cases as it was using that guidance to process them. And it was waiting for some further um, updates from the LGA um, who were seeking legal advice on how that affected the memorandum of understanding, um, which was the agreement between the LGA and the FBU. So as an update then from the meeting, that legal advice was received from the LGA um, in the middle of December. Um, and it was um, sent to all of the FRA's um, nominated legal contacts. And in summary, it essentially said that FRAs can still use the memorandum um, if they choose to do so, but there could be serious and expensive adverse tax consequences um, and there'd be no additional funding available to FRAs if it was um, considered not to be legitimate um, pension expenditure. Um, so the, um, the scheme manager um, for the bio scheme um, kind of reviewed that legal advice and the kind of the benefits of using the memorandum or not um, and came to um, the decision at this current time there were um, still financial risks there and potentially these unintended tax consequences that we could be putting members into if we adopted the MOU at this point in time. So at the moment, we are still um, um, not processing immediate detriment cases and any decision um, on adopting the MOU um, is still pending until um, we have some further clarity on the, the financial risks and, and the tax consequences. Um, so that is no change from the um, situation we were in before. Um, we're not processing immediate detriment cases. We're still waiting for further information. So it, we're not planning on communicating um, any further at this stage with members because that has been the position that's already been communicated. Um, however, we will respond to any queries that we receive directly. And um, I know that um, the Fire and Rescue Service have sort of communicate, have updated the FBO on our position as well. Um, so that that concludes my report of. Um, the current situation regarding immediate detriment. OK, all right. Well, th uh, thank you for that, Rachel. Um, one that immediately comes to my mind is about the legal advice that we got from uh, the LGA and um, uh, and the uh, uh, the risk, if you like, for uh, for heart for heart C, uh, for Hearts County Council. Have we sought any legal any other advice from uh, from Hearts County Council legal wise or any other legal um, uh, opinion? Um, we um, liaison with our own legal team, our own sort of nominated contact um, internally in um, HCC's legal department. But at this stage, we haven't sought our own external council advice. All right. And when do you think we might have a, a, an answer, a, a conclusion? What, to the whole immediate detriment? Um, well, the, I mean, the legislation is promised for October 23. Um, whether we hear anything in the meantime, I don't know, I'm afraid. All right, OK. All right, no, thank you for that. And uh, I've got some hands up and uh, uh, um, let me go to Jill first. Jill. Yeah, just to, to thank Rachel and her team for pulling this together, because this was a one that we asked as a one from the service, I, I know it might not be a satisfactory outcome, but it does give us a clear view on the current service manager's position. So thanks for that, Rachel. Yeah, okay. yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, Darren. Uh, thank you, Chair. So um, this might actually help with your 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 question, Chair. And, and Rachel, I, I might be wrong about this, but 
weren't there three parties to the MOU? So it was the uh, the LGA, uh, the FBU and the employers who were represented by a, a legal team to, to come up with that MOU. So I think there was employer input in the original MOU. Um, I can see you nodding, so I, th I, th I, th I think that's that's correct. So I don't know if that helps, Chair, in terms of your question. Yeah, it does. Thank you, Darren. Yeah. Um, and I suppose really, for me, as a member representative, it'd be remiss of me not to mention the, the, the substantial effect that this is having on some of the members. Now, I understand the complexities of it. I, I fully appreciate that and, and that a, a risk uh, benefit calculation has got to be made whether to proceed without, without the removal of, of the guidance. But it was just a highlight to, to officers and to the rest of the board. You know, I've had contact from members who, um, you know, on an individual level, and I certainly won't um, mention any individual cases in this meeting, but it is having a substantial effect on, on some people. Um, and there are, other, there are others, I understand, that have taken a different view in, in, in other fire and rescue authorities um, in, in terms of processing them under the MOU. Um, it, it, was, it was more of a comment than, than anything else, Chair, just to, to, to reiterate that, that uh, effect that it's having. Thank you. Yeah, no, uh, and and I appreciate that, Darren. I think you know where, where there is a cause for concern and um, uh, and it's highlighted by members that, that it's it, it's only right and proper that it's brought before the board and uh, and, and I think you are you know uh, well well within your rights to do that. Uh, thank you. Uh, anything else, Rachel? Then that we should know. Um, no, just that we're we're of course monitoring the situation and you know keeping an eye on that um and if any new information or guidance does come up then we'll, you know we'll, we'll be yeah. acting on it can i ask then that to, you know that 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 we do keep monitoring it at a very high level uh and to come back to the board you know as speedily as uh, uh, as you can um and I echo, you know, Jill's uh, comment that she made uh, earlier as well. Uh, if it's imp if it's important to members, then it's important to this board. Uh, and I take Darren's view on that very, uh, uh, very seriously as well. Mm. All right. Uh, are there no other questions then? Uh, all right. Well, I think we we're almost at the end. Um, uh, we need to vote on that one then. So if I can ask you to. Uh, uh, indicate in the uh, uh, chat box for, against or abstain. One, two, three, four. Yeah, OK, all agreed. Thank you very much indeed for that. And uh, finally, we just move on to uh, uh, agenda item six, which is the um, uh, the dates of future meetings. Um, and I would invite everybody to note, uh, I don't think we need to vote on this one, but uh, Theresa will tell me otherwise, but uh, um, to note the dates uh, coming up uh, for the future. And I think we've got four, the 20th of July, uh, the 14th of October, the 16th of December, uh, that's when uh, uh, the minutes pies come out, and uh, uh, I'll be looking forward to that. Uh, the 23rd of March next year, and the 19th of July next year, uh, and they're all at 10 a.m. Um, we don't need to vote on that, do we, Theresa? We can all note that in our diary. That's correct, Chairman. Yeah, we don't need to vote. Right. Uh, Theresa is a hard taskmaster and will tell me off otherwise. All right then, uh, and item seven, um, uh, any other part one business? Uh, uh, I don't know if anybody, I'm quite liberal here, if anybody's got any burning question they want to ask or, or bring up uh, that we ought to know about, uh, call for a report or anything like that, I'm quite happy to uh, accommodate anybody. And I don't see anybody nodding or flashing or anything like that at all. There is no part two business, so we have come to the end of the meeting. Again, I uh, I wish um, uh, uh, Godspeed and a fair win to Jill, uh, and again thank her very much indeed for uh, for her time and also with the uh, uh, with this board. 
So uh, unless I'm told otherwise, yeah, and a good clap, I think, there from uh, from Darren. Well done. No, re really appreciate it, Jill. Uh, unless there's any other matter, thank you very much indeed for uh, those who are listening uh, from the public. Very important. And thank you for my colleagues uh, on the board today for their time. And I know it's very precious uh, within the fire service. So uh, well done to you. All right. Goodbye then. Thank, Thank you, you Chairman. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.